it's kind of a it's kind of an awkward situation, really. If you read between the lines in the New Testament, there's a lot of conflict going on, and the conflict centered around this. Paul went around and preached to Gentiles, and he started churches based on a simple premise or a simple assertion or a simple doctrine. And his doctrine was, as he told the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Period. Nothing else added. No other requirements. No other duties. No other obligations. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Now, the church in Jerusalem, when they found out about that, they were not happy. They were displeased. And so they began to send out, uh, we might say, missionaries or uh, individuals who went to all of the churches that Paul started after he left. They, always, they generally waited till in Antioch, they didn't wait till he was gone. They came right there. And they said, now, it's not enough to believe in Jesus. You must also be circumcised and submit to the law of Moses. Paul disagreed with that. And uh, you can read about this in Acts chapter 15. They went back to Jerusalem and had a big presentation in front of uh, James and uh, wanted to get a decision. In fact, uh, I, I had torn just look this up here. Let's, let's go back and read this just for a second. I think you won't, might find this interesting. Acts chapter 15 uh, and Torrin, I'll tell you what verse just in a second here. And so Paul and Barnabas and also the accusers of Paul and Barnabas, the uh, people who disputed with him, they all went to Jerusalem to uh, get this all settled. Can people, can Gentiles be saved just by believing in Jesus or do they have to first uh, basically convert to Judaism and uh, keep the law of Moses and be circumcised. Um, let's start with verse 5. Here they have arrived in Jerusalem and Paul had told them everything that had been going on and how the Gentiles are coming to Christ. And instead of applauding him and saying, good work, Paul, uh, good work with your missionary preaching to the Gentiles, getting all these Gentiles to come to Christ, it says, verse 5, there arose certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. Now this means that these were people who were Pharisees. These were the strictest observers of the law of Moses. But now they believed. They believed in Jesus, but their background was they were Pharisees. And here's what they said. That it was needful. In other words, necessary. Needful means necessary. It was necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. That was their opinion. Uh, now Paul is acting on a revelation he got from Jesus. When Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, he didn't say anything about circumcision or the law of Moses. He just said, go preach to them to put their faith in me, and they'll be sanctified by their faith in me. So that's what Paul did. But these Pharisees disagreed with that, who believed. These were Christians, but also who held to the ideas of the Pharisees. Verse 6, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. So now there's going to be a big discussion. And when there had been much disputing, that means there was a big argument. That's what disputing means. Listen to this now. Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, he's talking about something that happened in Acts chapter 10, five chapters earlier. Now, you probably know this story. Uh, a Roman centurion saw an angel, and the angel said, Go and call for this man Peter, and he'll tell you what you need to hear. And Peter went to the house of these Gentiles uh, in the home of this Roman centurion, and he began to preach to them. And before he could even finish his message, when he came to the part about believing in Jesus, they all believed, and they evidently got saved right on the spot because the Holy Spirit filled them as He did with the Jewish believers in Acts chapter 2 and they all began to speak in tongues and prophesy. And Peter and the Jewish uh, friends that came with him, they all looked at each other and kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, well, what can we do now? I guess God accepted them, you see. And so He baptized them. Well, He got in big trouble for doing that because he didn't circumcise them or command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, that's what he's alluding to. Peter says, you know that a while back uh, that I went and preached to the Gentiles. That's what he's talking about. Verse 8, And God which knoweth the hearts, this is a really important thing here, God knows the hearts. See, we just look on the outside, but God knows the hearts. God knows which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as He did to us. Verse 9, and he put no difference between us and them. In other words, as far as God was concerned, he doesn't care who's Jewish and who's Gentile. Get that? He doesn't care 
anything about any ethnic or racial or, or cultural differences. God just ignores all that. Uh, God which knows the hearts, uh, verse 9. He put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. By the way, this is exactly what Jesus said to Paul on the road to Damascus. He said, those who are sanctified by their faith in me, verse 10. Now therefore, listen to this, now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke on the neck of the disciples? In other words, a burden on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Interesting uh, and very uh, blunt and honest comment by Peter. He says, why do you want to put something on them that we couldn't even deal with? That's what he's saying. Uh, why do you want to add something to it? Why do you want to add a burden to them? Listen to this, verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they. Well, that little statement there, that could have come straight out of Paul's mouth. That's what Paul was preaching, that by the grace of God you're saved. Uh, like this little banner I have behind me, which comes from Ephesians 2.8. By grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Peter is really standing up for Paul. And really, if you consider what Peter's saying here, his logic is unassailable. You can't, dis you can't find any fault with what he just said. There's no way to <laughs> disagree with this. I mean, who, wh on what point could anyone disagree with what he said? It's self-evident that what he said is true. Uh, so what happened? Verse 12, Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they held their peace, James answered. Now he's the boss. He's the head of the church there. He's in charge. And he said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, that's Peter, hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will again uh, build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who do all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols. That means uh, don't go to the idols' temples and, and I guess eat the meat that was offered to idols. They, the, that's what they used to do. They took food and offered it to the idols. And of course the, the idols didn't eat the food, as you know. And uh, so then they would sell that food or eat it themselves. And he said, don't, you know, Eat this food offered to idols, that's what he means. And from fornication, that's sexual immorality. And from things strangled and from blood. That means, again, this, this food, that uh, meat that still had the blood in it. So he just gives these simple uh, little rules. And uh, it says, don't, don't, we don't have to require to be circumcised or to keep the law. Just these simple uh, general moral principles. Well, uh, look at verse... Uh, well, he go, let's go on. Verse 21. Uh, For Moses of old time hath uh, in every city them that preach him and read and being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. In other words, it's not like Moses is going to suffer in this. Everybody, you know, everybody knows and everybody's aware of what the law says. Verse 22. Then pleased at the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch. That's where they, Paul's church was at that time. With Paul and Barnabas namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief among them, among the brethren. And so what they did was they sent uh, people back and saying, here's what the church in Jerusalem has decided. Just keep these simple rules. Well, that all sounds like it's all settled. But the fact of the matter is, if you read Paul's epistles, you find out that in every single one of his churches, somebody came from somewhere telling them that they had to keep the law, or let's just simplify it, that you had to do something else that you had to do more. You remember what Peter said, why do you want to put a yoke, why do you want to put a burden on them and require them to do more? Uh, see, God knows their hearts and He accepts them because they put their faith in Jesus. Now let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is what was happening 
in the Corinthian church. Paul was no longer present with them, but people had begun to arrive to tell them that what Paul's preaching is not enough. It's not enough just to believe in Jesus. You also have to do, and you know what? You can just fill in the blank. You, can ha you have to do something else. And whatever that is, uh, it's adding to it. It's adding to believing or faith in Jesus. Now, Paul feels as though he has to defend himself uh, before these Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, and he feels like a fool for having to do that. Because they ought to be taking his preaching more seriously. He's the reason that they're even Christians. So he says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. Verse 2, he explains, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband. You notice that it's singular there. One husband. Now he's using a metaphor. Uh, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He's using a metaphor of a marriage, and he's saying, just like uh, a man and a woman uh, are uh, you know, engaged to be married, he says, it's like that. He says, I am presenting you to, to Christ, one husband. In other words, I'm not going to marry you to, to multiple ideas, multiple doctrines, various things. This is what he wants to emphasize. It's a singular thing. It's just faith in Christ alone. Uh, and he's using marriage as a metaphor. But then he expands his symbol and he includes the Old Testament story about Adam and Eve, verse 3. He says, but I fear, in other words, this is what I've, the reason I'm acting the way I am, I'm, I'm fearful, I'm anxious. He says, I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That's what he's really worried about. He says, I don't want your minds to be uh, corrupted, or let's say it this way, led astray from the simplicity. This word simplicity literally means singleness. The simplicity or the singleness that's in Christ. It's, it's simple because it's a, it's a single focus. Faith in Christ. Um, but look at, let's look at this example of Eve for just a second. He says, I'm afraid that just like the serpent tempted Eve through his subtlety, he says, I don't want that to happen to you. Now, what did happen to Eve? Well, if you go back to Genesis, and we're not going to turn there, I'll just see if I can tell it, and I think you know the story. It's not that it's an unfamiliar story. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting if you read the creation story. In uh, Genesis chapter 1, when it's talking about the days of creation, we have uh, one version of it in which God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And it says, male and female, he created, created he them. And then in chapter 2, it talks about how he took the dust of the earth and formed Adam's body. So what I assume is in chapter 1, what he's talking about is the conceptual. He conceived of man, mankind, as male and female. But here's the important point. What we read in chapter 1, when he conceived of mankind as male and female, he said, let us make man in, my, in our image and in our likeness. Uh, by the way, if you've ever read that and wondered why it says plural, our image and our likeness, it's because uh, the word that's translated God is actually a word that uh, in the Hebrew language has a plural suffix on it, Elohim, the I am on the end implies plural. And so the translators are trying to observe that. Uh, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. It's really God speaking. Um, and it's, you know, I mean, there's no sense in trying to puzzle out why, why it is that way. But, but here's the point. Um, man was conceived and created in the image and likeness of God. So then we could say that man, when he was first created, and Eve, male and female, created them in his own image and likeness. Uh, when you know, we read about the actual creation of Adam formed from the dust of the earth, and then God breathed into that body, and he became alive with the life of God. God breathed life into him. And then he, you know the story about how he took the rib and then formed Eve. Uh, so now we have Adam and Eve. They are alive with the life of God, and they are like God. They are created in His likeness. So they are like God. 
as like God as it is possible to be. Now let me ask you a question. What could you possibly do to improve on that situation? He created him and her, created them, and breathed life, his own life. They're alive with the life of God, and God comes down in the cool of the day and walks with them, and they can, they can communicate with God and on, on, on terms of, 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 I don't want to say equality necessarily, but, they, but they're, uh, there's, no, there's no distinction or difference between them. They, have, they share the same life. How could you make that better? What's missing? Nothing's missing. It's a perfect situation. God created it. He did it. It's His work. Uh, there's nothing lacking. There's nothing missing. This is why Paul makes this comparison. Because here's what the serpent did. He came along to Eve and he implied that you need to do more. That there is something missing. He says, you know, Eve, what you really need is this tree of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil knowledge of good and evil, moral knowledge. You need to know the tree, what the, you, you need to, you know, have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, you need to do more. And it, you know what he said to her? He said, he said, because if you'll eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be like God. Now, I know in the King James translation it says God's little g with an s on it, but that's incorrect. It's the same exact word that's talking about God in chapter 1 where it says God created the heavens and the earth, Elohim. What the serpent's really saying is, Eve, you need to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you'll be like God. <laughs> what she should have said and what she could have said is, I'm already like God. <laughs> but see, this is why Paul's worried about the subtlety of the serpent. She was already like God. There was nothing she needed to do to be more like God. She was as like God as it was possible to be without actually being Him. She was as like God as it was possible to be because He created her that way, in His image, in His likeness. So uh, what the serpent was tempting her with was uh, something sh to add something to it. Um, and you know the story, uh, that, that that's exactly what happened. And uh, the sad thing about it is that when they did eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, as the serpent said, their eyes were opened. But what they were open to was uh, not something good, but something bad. They were, their eyes were open to their own lack and their own inadequacy, which they were not supposed to be aware of. Uh, they were naked from the very beginning, but they just weren't aware of it. That's what we're told. Anyway, so Paul here says, now just like the serpent tempted Eve with his subtlety, I'm afraid he's going to do the same to you that your minds, listen, shall be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, the singleness that is in Christ. Well, you know what he means by that? He means, uh, I, don't want you, I don't want some message to come to you that says you've got to do more than you've already done by believing in Jesus. Now, I'm going to turn now to a passage that we read a couple of weeks ago, so don't be offended if I read something that I've already read once. Um, it won't hurt to read it twice, will it? <laughs> Like I heard one person say, uh, if you go to a restaurant and order something good, that's, you know, if you go back and order it again and get, eat the same thing twice, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, th uh, Torin, this is in Colossians chapter 2. And um, I remember just a week or two ago, I can't remember which, we read this, but here I want to read it again. What does he mean when he says the simplicity or the singleness that is in Christ? That means you can't add anything to it. That means your faith in Christ brings you into uh, the right relationship with God that cannot be uh, added to. You don't need to add any more to it. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, Torin, and verse 9. 8. How about verse 8? How about verse 7? <laughs> Sorry. It's also good. I don't know where to start. Okay, let's take with verse 7. Uh, okay, Paul is saying rooted and built up in Him. That means we're rooted in Christ. Remember what he said, I don't want your minds to be corrupted from the simpleness, the simplicity or the singleness that's in Christ. He says here to the Colossians, I want you to be rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith. That means secure in the faith as you have been taught. By faith, he means faith in Christ. You know, that's what he taught them. Uh, we could sum up Paul's message in the words that he used when the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. It's all about faith in Christ, as you have been taught. 
abounding therein with thanksgiving. Let's get the next verse. Beware, he says, lest any man spoil you. That means take advantage of you. Don't let anyone take advantage of you. That is a big problem, uh, by the way, in the church world. How? Uh, through philosophy. That means ideas. Philosophy, vain deceit. After the traditions of men. That means man-made ideas or ideas that sound plausible to the human mind. After the rudiments of the world. That means the elementary principles. That means common sense ideas. You know, a lot of things that sound like common sense, uh, it's just human ideas. Don't let anybody lead you astray with human ideas which are not after Christ. Listen to this, verse 9. It says, For in him, that is in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now you notice that it says that in him is resident or dwells uh, all the fullness, fullness means everything there is of it, of the Godhead. Now, we don't use that word Godhead in our everyday life. I don't. It just, it's a funny word. It's an odd word. It just means the attributes of God. All of, it says, in Christ, in Him, are resident all of the attributes of God bodily. That's what he's saying. Now, we don't have any problem with that. Everybody agrees with that. That's easy to understand. We understand that Jesus has within him all the attributes uh, of God. There's no problem with that. But here's the thing that is that most Christians don't understand and is hard to accept, but nevertheless is true. Just as he says, in him dwell all the, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10, listen to this. This is what's shocking. Verse 10 says, and you, that is to say, you, the Christian reader, you are complete in Him. Now the same in Him about Jesus, dwell, in which dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, God's attributes bodily, the same in Him is now used about you. It says you are complete because you're in connection with Him, because you're hooked up with Him. You're in a union with Him. That's what being a Christian means. Because you believe in Jesus, you enter into a spiritual union with Him. And now everything that, that He has is now yours. It's all mingled together. Now this is a shocking thing. All the attributes of God are now part of your attributes as well. Not on the outside, but on the inside. That seems too good to be true. That seems too big. That seems too... Uh, fantastical, but it, nevertheless it is true. He says, you're in Him, and not only that, he says, you're complete in Him. You know what it means to be complete? Well, it just means you can't add anything to it. You can't make it better. Um, when we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, I remember I looked it up in all kinds of different places. I remember looking it up and finding out that in the, the Greek language from which this word is taken, uh, it's a word that means, according to Strong's Concordance, crammed full. Like you, you take a net and it's crammed full of fish, like you read about in, in the Bible even. You are crammed full with all the attributes of God uh, because you're in Christ, in Him, uh, in union with Him, hooked up with Him. Again, not on the outside where you see it, but on the inside where God sees it. God who knows the hearts. Now. You see, this is why Paul said, don't let the serpent corrupt your minds from the simplicity that's in Christ. In other words, the simplicity that's in Christ is that you are complete in Him. Everything that can be accomplished has been accomplished in you. Just like Eve was made in the likeness of God, you also, because you're in Christ, are now godlike in your character on the inside, and you can't improve upon it. So don't let somebody lead you astray, he's saying, by coming along and saying you need to do something or you need to add to it. You need to become more spiritual or you need to get closer to God by doing this or doing that or doing this other thing. He has made you as, well, I'm just going to stay with what he says here. He says you are complete in him. You can't add to it. You can't make it better. You can't improve upon it. Now, I've been a Christian long enough to know that 
uh, the church is full of ideas about how to make it better. <laughs> but Paul says, don't let anybody lead you astray from the simplicity, the singleness uh, that's in Christ. Now, there's a beautiful illustration of this that I'd like to read to you. And this is in Luke's Gospel. And I like this one a lot because it's so easy to see. I like things that are easy to see. This is in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. And I'm going to begin reading torn Luke chapter 10 with verse 38. You remember uh, a word that came up a minute ago that I highlighted to you. Uh, when Paul was uh, at Jerusalem disputing with those Pharisees who believed, uh, the thing that they said that Paul violently disagreed with was, they said, it's not enough for those Gentile converts to just believe in Jesus. Here's what they said. It was needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. They said it was needful. The word needful means necessary. Paul said, no, it's not needful. It's not necessary because they're already complete in him because they put their faith in him, because they're believing in him as a savior. Now that word needful is going to come up in this passage too, and I just want you to remember that. Uh, verse 38. Here's a story from the Gospels. Uh, now it came to pass as they went that they entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now get this, Martha and Mary living in this house. Jesus is in the house. Mary, it says, sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now, in this story, that's all we're going to read. That's all we're going to find out about Mary. She just decided she was going to sit at his feet and hear his word. What that tells me is that her attention was focused on Christ and nothing else. She just wanted to hear what he had to say. She wanted to tune in to him, and that's what she did. But Martha <coughs> didn't see things that way. <coughs> Verse 40, Martha, it says, was cumbered. And that's a funny word, cumbered. You ever say that when, in your everyday life? That's a Sunday word, <laughs> cumbered. That means uh, uh, carrying a burden. That means distracted. That means, you know, if you, I looked it up, by the way. It literally means, the literal Greek word literally means led astray. Isn't that a funny thing? Led astray, distracted is what it means. She is distracted. Now, Mary is not distracted. She's got her attention focused on Jesus singly. Uh, Martha, it says, was distracted uh, with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Now, you get what she's saying. Here I am working, and she's sitting, just sitting there listening. But I'm doing all this work. She's left me to serve alone. Now, I just want to point out to you that what we've read so far, have, have we read where Jesus told her to serve, where Jesus told her to get to work? <laughs> Did you read that? No, we didn't read that. Jesus didn't tell her to do what she was doing. Now, uh, Martha's upset. Verse 40 says she was uh, cumbered with much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And in other words, tell her to get up off that floor and help me. Verse 41, Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful. That means full of care and troubled about many things. Now, I just want you to highlight in your mind where it says many things. You remember what Paul said to the Corinthians. I don't want you to be uh, corrupted from the simplicity the singleness of Christ. Now Martha, it says, is distracted, careful, troubled about many things. Um, what, what is fascinating to me about this story, before I read the conclusion, is uh, here is Martha and Mary, two people. They are in the presence of Jesus, and they are having opposite experiences. Uh, Mary, we presume, is experiencing peace and rest. She's sitting at his feet hearing his word. But Martha is disturbed. Martha, it says, is full of anxiety. She's troubled. 
she's in turmoil, she's upset. And what I see in this is the difference is not Jesus' fault, it's not God's fault, it's not that God chose uh, you know, trouble for one and peace for the other one, it's, it's because of how they regarded Jesus, how they thought about Him. Martha, it says, was uh, careful about many things, Jesus said. There's many different things on her mind all at the same time. And here's what she thinks. She thinks Jesus is somebody that you have to work for. She thinks Jesus is somebody that you serve or that you work for. That's how she regards Him. Mary evidently regarded Jesus as someone with whom you have a relationship because she is sitting at His feet hearing His Word. The difference was on their part because of how they regarded Jesus. And Jesus does not commend Martha. He, in fact, He's correcting her. He says to her, you are troubled and careful about many things, a multitude of things. By contrast, look at what He says about Mary in verse 42. But one thing is needful. We could paraphrase that and say, only one thing is necessary. Uh, there's only one necessary thing. And Mary hath chosen that good part. In other words, Mary chose the one thing that's necessary. And it shall not be taken away from her. Now, he says Mary uh, chose the only thing, the one thing that's needful. The one thing that's necessary. And what is the one thing that's necessary? Well, the one thing that's needful, the one thing that's necessary, is to be focused on Christ as to be centered, your attention centered on Him. Uh, this is why Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he says, what I'm worried about you is that the serpent will tempt you uh, and corrupt your minds from the simplicity, the single focus on Christ. Jesus here is confirming that and saying, you know, Mary has her attention focused on me and that's the only thing that's necessary. Now, uh, you know, uh, let me just add in passing that, yes, we may do things, we may work and we may, uh, you know, serve and we may do all kinds of good things, but it's where, where is our attention focused? Um, we don't do those things to, to be approved or to, you know, to make our position better. Uh, we are complete in Him, can't make it any better, and what we do is just what we do because that's what we do. Here's a good way to keep it in perspective. Uh, look at what Paul said um, in 2 Corinthians, no, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Torn, if you could find that for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you want to know how to put our actions and our work into the right perspective, again, look at Paul as an example. Paul's a good example for us. Verse um, 10. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. There we go. He's, listen to what he says. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's an important thought. It's because of God's unmerited favor, because of God's gift. Uh, it's His work. Because By the grace of God I am what I am. And His grace, that is His unmerited favor, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. It was not for no effect. You listen. But I labored more abundantly than they all. They all means the other apostles. He just got through talking about them. He says, I worked more than all of them put together. Uh, Listen to this, though. This is really important. This is his attitude. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. He says, you know, if you want to talk about work, he says, I worked more than all of them. He says, but you know, the real truth of it is, it wasn't even me. It was the grace of God that was with me. That's his attitude about it. His attention. Well, where is his attention focused? Well, he tells us himself, and uh, I know I've read this before, but I'd like to read it again. Uh, Torin, this is in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And I'll, uh, I'll end with this one. Uh, again, uh, let me remind you that the verses were added by the translators, and Paul didn't put a number 20 here, Galatians 2.20. Uh, he's just writing along here. So actually there's two sentences here. There's two thoughts, two independent thoughts. They're both good, but the one I want is the second one. Um, Paul here says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. That's the same thing he said back there when he said, Yet not I, but the grace of God works in me. It's not me. Um, that's a really good uh, perspective to have. In this Christian life, it's not you, it's Him. 
He keep, Paul keeps saying, yet not I. Even in his work, he said, it was the grace of God laboring with me. The Christian life is all about him. It's not about you and your work. It's about him and his work. All we do in this thing is we put our faith in Jesus. That's the simplicity that's in Christ. We are made complete in him because we do nothing more than put our faith in Jesus. All the rest is his work. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Now listen to this. Here's what I wanted to get to. This is the second part. And the life which I now live in the flesh, he's talking about in this world, the flesh means in his body, physical body, in this physical world with all of, all of the things that we have to deal with in this physical life, all of the, you know, the frustrations and the problems and the aggravations and everything of that kind, everything in our physical lives. This is how Paul says, here's where my focus is. Here's, where, here's how I live this life in the flesh. How? By faith in the Son of God. In other words, the great apostle Paul He's holding on to the same thing he preached to them, the simplicity that's in Christ. It's all about one single thing, my faith in Him. Just like Mary sat at His feet, heard His word with her attention focused on Christ. Paul says, that's what I do. I, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That means faith in Jesus. And not only that, he says, and here's what it is about it that's forefront in my mind who loved me and gave himself for me. Now you see, Jesus didn't die on the cross just for Paul. You were included as well. So you could say the same thing. Uh, I live by faith in Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. And because of that, I'm now complete in him. I have everything I need for my spiritual life. I'm as close to God as it's possible to get by the blood of Jesus. Did you know he says that specifically? So we could adopt this as our motto as well. It's not just Paul here. Uh, the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And by doing that, he brought us into connection to God, into a right relationship with God, into a condition of acceptance with God that cannot be improved upon, that cannot be made better. It's as good as it can possibly be. And what he wrote to the Corinthians was, don't let anybody lead you astray or distract you from, uh, from what's already uh, the case. Okay, I think that's all I got today. Let's all stand up.